All right, everybody. Welcome to Track One, Day One, Diana Initiative. Thank you for being here. A couple quick housekeeping announcements before we get started. I encourage you to check out our lock picking village, which is just down the hall to the left. Or if you feel in the mood to be crafty, we have got an exciting maker and soldering village that's over by the Reg desk. And then, of course, I'd like to thank our generous sponsors who've helped make this happen, some of whom are just right out there. We have Sinek, we have Toyota, we have Remediant, we have Recorded Future, Microsoft, and just peruse their tables, say hello. You never know what you're going to find. And now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Ian Islam, who is going to be speaking on breaking silos, something we talk about a lot in this industry. Ian is the Associate Policy Director, Cybersecurity and Emerging Threats, yes, I'm reading from the slide, it's easy, from the R Street Incident Institute. And without any further ado, I give you Ian. Enjoy. Oh, questions will be at the end. Thank you, Cheryl. And let me take off my mask so that way you can hear me clearly and unobstructed. First of all, I want to give uh, my thanks and gratitude for Diane Initiative for um, having me speak today. It's an absolute privilege going from being an attendee and participant to all of a sudden a few years later now being on stage with you to share this information um, that I think is going to be critical and informative but also valuable to have your experience in the policy field, um, particularly in the public policy space um, and in conversations when it comes to national cybersecurity policy and strategy. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to give a quick introduction just to kind of like lay, lay the land. Um, as Cheryl kindly shared, I'm the Associate uh, Policy Director of Cybersecurity and Emerging Threats at R Street Institute. Before that, I had the good pleasure of working at CISA, um, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, as an IT specialist uh, specializing in information security. Um, in that role, I had um, you know, various opportunities to start off my career as a cyber strategist, working on various special initiatives, trying to help the agency uh, collaborate more closely with Department of Defense's um, uh, uh, pol policy office, and as well as uh, instituting a lot of the National Defense Authorization Act uh, special initiatives. Uh, then also, in addition to working closely with our aviation cyber initiative partners, uh, in ensuring that the task force was stood up with our partners at FAA and as well as uh, DOD. And last but not least, um, having the, you know, the privilege of supporting the nation and serving as a liaison for CISA under Operation War Speed during the pandemic before realizing that there was an opportunity presented to me to delve in and get actual operational experience, work in the vulnerability management side, understand what frontline analysts, um, specialists, assessors get to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So having to work with the brightest minds in regard to developing mitigation reports and seeing firsthand how there seemed to be a disconnect um, when it came to what were the policies that were being recommended and developed, but then also how was that information filtering down to staff who had to implement and ensure that the information and the and the pieces were actually being um, initiated and, and, and resolved versus to taking that experience and also reciprocating it back up the chain to say, hey, great ideas, unfortunately, you're breaking stuff. Um, there are some operational consequences here. And um, I also like to share that I consider myself like the friendly neighborhood cat. I like to be as disruptive as I can be whenever possible, ask a lot of good questions. Um, and if I seem a little bit of a nuisance, my apologies, but it's more so to help build the bridges and the divides between different groups. And, but I have been told that I've been a good cat herder um, since I like cats. So it's kind of a win-win. But before I get into my presentation, I um, wanted to highlight and share that this presentation is a little bit different from a couple of that you've heard today. Um, uh, this is going to be a little bit more along the lines of how do we get existing practitioners to actually share their experience with the relevant policymakers who are making critical decisions today. Um, 
what this conversation is not going to be about is uh, in terms of how to break into cyber. There were a lot of great talks that happened today, uh, how to um, initiate and, and build uh, greater communities, um, because there is a reality, and the reality is that our current landscape is sorely in need of a number of cybersecurity practitioners. We went from having a gap of close to 500,000 cybersecurity practitioners sorely needed in the field. And within a year, it's now up to a little over 700,000. But what's also fascinating, if you look at it from a policy making standpoint, interestingly, is how there aren't that many on the Hill. Um, there's a couple of programs out there that are looking to increase the number of specialists, technologists who have actual, like, you know, operational and um, academic experience to bring their knowledge and expertise to Congress. Um, as of 2015, only seven out of the 3,500 legislative staff had formal technology training. But as a result of programs like Tech Congress, it's now increased to a little over 65. Do we still have a long way to go? Absolutely. Why is that the case? Because just in this new congressional session alone, we have had over 498 proposed cybersecurity um, legislative proposals. And a number of them are either holistically cyber or in part. And nine so far have actually passed into law. We have recently seen uh, as a strong example where there's a lot of discussion happening in the community is the passing of the Critical Infrastructure Reporting Act, um, CERCIA, uh, of uh, 2021. And that is going to change the landscape for a number of uh, folks in the security sector. Why is that? Because that's gonna now require you know, critical infrastructure uh, entities to now report to the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency all of the ransomware incidents that they've been experiencing and data breaches that they've been experiencing and also to respond within a set number of hours. What those hours are and what those actual regulations would look like are still under the works. They won't be completed um, until about, or finalized until about 2000, 2024, um, but should go, the promulgation of the, of the proposed rulemaking should be up by sometime next year. So I say this to say it's really critical to, to share the value of, of you know, these sort of legislative proposals that are coming down the pike. Um, executive orders that tend to fill the gap are more so to ensure that if Congress doesn't have the time or the bandwidth to pass um, critical laws that will help promote uh, the security of our, of, of our you know, systems and of our infrastructure, then in that case, this is where um, utilizing the executive powers and the authorities for the regulatory agencies uh, that can then exert their ability to pass down rules, orders, guidance, and help shape and influence what's happening in the sector. But I say that all to say that, but why is it that you're really needed? Um, in my personal viewpoint, especially from when I was working at the operational level and working closely with stakeholders in the utility industry as well as the healthcare industry and aviation industry in particular, what I noticed was is that there is a clear divide, but there is firsthand knowledge and experience that each and every one of you have that happen in the front lines. For example, if this new law for incident reporting is gonna get passed, how is that gonna impact the Security Operations Center when it comes to aggregating all of the incident logs and triaging it in a manner that um, is not only automated, but understandable, not only for internal purposes, but also for regulatory requirements and or to even help inform the safety and security of the sector at large and then the nation at large. So there is that um, trickle down effect and there is a clear line of relationship of where your work is impacting current policies and laws, but also how the current policies and laws will impact your day to day. 
time and time again, I've had an opportunity to talk with friends, um, security experts in the field, as well as uh, those also on the Hill, and keep hearing about how there are legislative offices, whether it is on Capitol Hill or on the state level, and there is, and also from government officials, and there is always a constant need and desire to hear directly from the entities that have to not only, you know, build their business, but also implement it, how it's operationalized. The truth of the matter is, is that when it comes to public-private partnership, the important piece is the partnership, the information sharing. Government can only do but so much, but the reality is, is that if they are at will responding to the threats that keep happening, the, the ransomwares, the, so, the solar winds, the colonial pipelines, and being reactive by creating uh, rules and regulations as a result of the impending threats that come from adversary adversary actors, whether it's uh, from you know criminal organizations, state-sponsored actors, and even um, going to nation-state actors. The truth of the matter is, is that it's very, very, very important that the private sector entities have a seat at the table to say, this is what we're doing to fix it, and this is how we're doing to fix it. But one of the ways it can help is having those who you know are actually having to deal with the day-to-day -to, -day to share what is it that they're seeing so if you're in the cyber threat intelligence group then obviously there's you know all the reports and threat profiles that you write up go up to senior leadership but what if you feel that there is a chance for you to actually do a little bit more and um, you can either do it through your organization or you could do it through uh, community groups well here are the different ways that you can be a change agent. And I can attest to the fact that, you know, by being a part of the community and as well as joining different groups, which I'm gonna share and highlight right now, are avenues and ways that um, it's very critical and important to have your voices reflected in the current uh, national discourse that's happening when it comes to how we're protecting our systems, but most importantly, how are we going to uh, set um, processes that and policies that will make um, the efforts more efficient for you, but also give a better um, exposure to what is the actual current threat landscape. So here are a couple of examples of, of how you can get involved. Fellowships is a clear and um, way that uh, multiple um, folks can, can actually participate. Um, one clear example is Tech Congress, as I mentioned earlier. Um, they, just as a um, notification to share, they uh, actually have their January fellowship period open um, and extended until next week. So if you're interested, please apply. Because um, it's always a good opportunity if you're looking for a change of pace and looking to um, understand a little bit but more um, how the legislative process works, um, either on um, the Hill, on the House side, or on the Senate side, you do get an opportunity to get paired um, and to um, help shape and influence uh, national laws. The other aspect is also through uh, Share the Mic and Cyber. They have a campaign to raise the profile and voices of underrepresented practitioners in the field. Uh, so that is also another avenue to come and shape and share your experience if you're an underrepresented group, particularly um, in the uh, black cybersecurity practitioner community to share your viewpoints, your thought leadership, and help push the needle forward. CISA, I put CISA up there because recently they've also advertised their Innovations Fellows Program. They're very interested in hearing directly from experts who are willing to take a break from their private sector job, um, maybe work in government for a year or two, have an opportunity to share their expertise, drive the needle forward from and make those changes from within government. Quick disclaimer, I just have to say, please be patient because if you've ever worked in government, it is a bit of a machine and a bureaucratic process, so everyone's trying to do the right thing, but you know there are a lot of red tapes that need to get undone, and this is another way of helping um, remove the red tape, the barriers, and push things faster without breaking things at the same time. Google has a public policy fellowship uh, for 
uh, recent graduates that are interested in working in the nonprofit sector. My organization, Our Street Institute, is a, is a host organization for the Public Policy Fellowship, and uh, there's a whole number of other also uh, tech companies that are participating in the program, and that's also another way where either through your company or through companies like Google, um, getting a chance to work very closely with uh, the nonprofit and academic community to drive the needle forward. Now, when it comes to participating in security groups and organizations, I'm the Calvary is a grassroots organization of uh, security specialists, and um, and it's an, an opportunity for folks to share their specific subject matter expertise in um, in in areas where uh, pushing both for uh, technical changes and standards um, policies, but also um, helping drive. The, the conversations that happens um, behind the scenes at a national level. Uh, there have been instances where, uh, you know, either through that organization or in general, really, you can participate. If you're in the aviation sector, you could participate in the ISAC itself um, or the financial services ISAC. There are a number of information sharing an, uh, analysis centers where they have multiple working groups um, for you to go in, share, and highlight what are the areas that need to be um, altered for the better, whether, whether it is understanding the, the current needs of the industry and figuring out how it could be shared with government more appropriately, highlighting the, the better cross-collaboration and cross-functional <clears throat> needs uh, within the sector itself. Uh, then there's also a chance to even sometimes review a certain proposed legislation or a national level policies that may come out of the executive office in advance because um, these groups have good tie-in as part of you know their roles and responsibilities as a membership organization is to be tied into the current conversations so by partaking in the group you might have an opportunity to see documents and actually you know, redline it yourself or add comments to it and, and give your input to say whether or not these are good ideas, bad ideas, and if they're bad ideas, what is the alternative solution to fix it? There's also the development of local cyber civilian court. This is a relatively brand new idea that's um, still in the works. Michigan has its, is the only one that I know of that has its own cyber civilian court. Um, it uh, is an opportunity for local uh, security specialists to work closely with local law enforcement and support and provide their expertise on a voluntary basis on a number of initiatives. It could be helping on, uh, you know, with cybercrime, incident, sorry, cybercrime forensics, um, incident response, um, providing um, advisement and guidance on operational needs, um, also from an intelligence perspective, the list goes on and on. So there's also an opportunity like at a localized level to help work with um, state legislators or law enforcement to address the issues and, <clears throat> excuse me, and to provide opportunities to make that change at a local level if you're not interested in delving onto like the big stage and um, trying, <laughs> you know, uh, make, make big waves. If you feel like you wanna do incremental changes and start from a local level, then there's also the um, the, the, the local uh, cyber civilian corps. And also by participating in local conferences, like um, uh, for example, there's a number of B-side initiatives that happens across the country and that's where also another way of participating in the community, exchanging ideas um, and, um, and sharing information and also helping to drive change at a, at a local level. Last but not least, I didn't touch upon this because I wanted to save it for, for last, but writing. Writing is so important because it's a way to get your voice out there, either through a blog post or an op-ed, or as I said, through these various working groups, uh, having a chance to review um, proposed legislation or regulations or policy, that national level policy that come across your, your you know, inbox and you could provide um, your public comments during the, the review period. Sometimes you may not even um, have to wait for your organization. You can do things uh, as a private citizen, as anonymous, um, but at least that way you know that you, know, you have your own, 
your own ways and means of contributing to the dialogue and ensuring that there are multiple ways of, of, um, of getting your, your thought leadership in front of those who need to hear it. Um, last but not least, I wanted to also share just uh, an example that I heard, well, I had a conversation with a friend via text um, yesterday, and what was really interesting about the text was he was um, griping about the, the lack of, of, of representation in, the, in, in what he was seeing when it came to the field for industrial control systems and felt as if though that there needed to be greater emphasis because um, obviously, we're experiencing and have seen a number of attacks to our um, to critical infrastructure that are, you know, largely di driven by ICS and SCADA systems. Um, but also, he highlighted that there is a value to having those who may not realize it participate in working groups to shape standards, to shape policies, to help drive change, and that was. It was really important and I really appreciated him saying that to me because it just emphasized, interestingly, like without him knowing that this was gonna be the crux of my presentation, that you know, there, is, there is a need um, to, have, to have your voices heard. And so uh, without further ado, I wanna say thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate your time. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. And also available after this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any questions in the room? I have one question that came in through our chat. And the question for you, Ian, is, as mentioned and agreed, cybersecurity, SME, and government are greatly needed. Why do you think companies and organizations are only doing internships? fellowships or shorter term engagements for SMEs to engage instead of creating more permanence in these roles? That's, that's an excellent question about um, the need for, for more permanence in the roles. I, I, the short answer is I don't know why. Um, but I do hope that, you know, between this presentation, and I also know that there are different, uh, there are other presentation and talks that are going to be happening on other similar similar situated subjects. But it would be a, a great idea for uh, companies to invest more in their in-house um, cyber, cyber policy teams, particularly those that will also help foster collaboration with the engineers, the software developers. And, and bring those subject matter experts to the table. That, to me, is valuable. I mean, a lot of these organizations do have that in existence, and I'm not sure if there's a reliance on organization, membership organizations and associations to think that, that they're the only ones that can do it. They're an avenue, and, they're, and it has to be a multi-pronged approach, in my personal viewpoint. It's, tackle it through your membership affiliated organization because they have um, the capacity, especially from a lobbying aspect, they probably have the better capacity to do that. Whereas internally, it's always good to start developing um, your expert, your you know, subject matter experts to have that public speaking experience to bring them to the table, to have an opportunity to share those experiences uh, directly and to answer those questions and to hear firsthand how legislators and government officials think and ask certain questions. I think there's a value by being in the room and hearing what they have, have to say. So I do hope that um, more, more of that bears, bears, uh, bears fruit. That was great, thank you. All right, any other questions? With that, thank you so much for being here for the talk.